Thank you, Abuna Michael, for your generosity. Every year, Abuna Michael blesses us at our Nahda at St. George and St. Shenouda. And this year, I said to him, Abuna, I already reserved you. He said, yes. I said, I'm worried that if I don't, if I, if I, if I don't impress, he might decide not to come. So at least I guaranteed he'll be visiting us in Jersey City next week, God willing. I'm very, very happy to be here. Uh, it's a big blessing for me. Um, uh, Abuna Michael uh, is very dear to us. He never misses an opportunity to come and speak with our youth specifically and with our English speakers um, and blessing us. And we're very grateful uh, for Abuna. And this is the smallest thing that we can do is to come and take the blessing of this beautiful church and this beautiful congregation. Um, Abuna asked me to speak about uh, St. Mary and intercession. And I figured maybe we spend a, a part of the conversation speaking about the concept of intercession. And then we talk about the story of uh, the wedding of Cana of Galilee and St. Mary and our Lord Je Jesus Christ and the little interaction that they had together. Um, to speak about intercession, many of the things we're going to uh, talk about today, I received, um, I've, uh, I've read from our beloved father, Pope Shenouda III of Blessed Memory. Um, if any of you have read Pope Shenouda III, his English books, their translations are weak, to be very honest. However, his holiness is very meticulous about every single detail, every single verse about any topic. So if you've ever want to know anything about a specific topic, his holiness is extremely thorough and he, he considers every verse and every detail. Um, so some of the things that we're speaking about, I, I, uh, just to give you a reference, is from His Holiness Pope Shunu III. Uh, there's a chapter on intercession uh, found in his Comparative Theology book. If you're interested in reading more, I, I didn't even skim the surface of all the different verses and quotes that he had for, uh, for the reader. The first thing I wanted to talk about is this idea of intercession versus, uh, what does intercession mean in the Orthodox Church? And many uh, denominations, when they speak about intercession, uh, they, um, th they think that we are referring to mediation. And they quote for us two verses, which I want to share with you. The first comes from the first epistle of John, chapter 2, verse 1. It says, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but also for the whole world. And St. Paul in 1 Timothy says something similar as well about our Lord Jesus Christ as the mediator. He says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And these two verses, um, people say, well, this is what it means to intercede, and we have a mediator, and that mediator is our Lord Jesus Christ. So what do you mean when you say you're going to ask a saint to pray for you? And His Holiness went into great detail, and I don't want to go through all the details, but the reality is these two verses, I'm going to highlight two statements in each of the verses, focus on one thing, and the thing is me, uh, what, with regards to atonement. So our Lord Jesus Christ is the only one that can come between me and God and fulfill this need for a savior. I have sin, and the only way that my sin will go away is if he, his blood, his sacrifice on my behalf. He is the mediator. And in both verses, it starts off by saying the one, but continues on and it refers to either propitiation or he gave himself ransom for all. This idea of ransom. So we have been sentenced to death as humanity, and the only way that we can pay our debt is if God comes, takes flesh, and dies on my behalf. So the, so the first point here is there's a difference between intercession and mediation. Me intercession is someone praying for someone else. And we'll talk about many places in the Bible that speaks about praying for others. But when it comes to mediation or atonement, someone to pay my price, there is only one, and it's our Lord Jesus Christ. So the first point, we're not talking about mediation. Only our Lord Jesus Christ can atone for me. But when we talk about intercession, simply means to pray for someone else. And in the epistle of St. James, um, in the epistle of St. James, 
chapter 5, verse 16, he says, Confess your trespasses to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So here, St. James is telling us directly, I need you to pray for one another. And St. Paul, in the epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 18 and 19, he says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end, all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Here, to summarize, St. Paul is saying, please pray for me. I need you to pray that God gives me words. Like when I came to speak right now, I said, Father, please pray for me, that the Holy Spirit it blesses the words that I have to say, and the words become God's words, effective words, transforming words, life-giving words. So here, St. Paul is saying the same thing. I need you to pray for me. So this idea of praying for one another is in the Bible. It's not novel. Not only is it in the Bible, there are many examples in the Bible where God tells people to pray. And then this is where I talk about His Holiness's uh, meticulous detail. His Holiness Pope Shenouda that will give a, a series, page after page after. He doesn't leave a single example of all the times God asks someone to pray. But I'm only going to give you a few just to give you the scope of this idea of praying for one another. First, he says... God commanded King Abimelech to pray for Abraham, uh, that Abraham prays for King Abimelech. If you remember the story, Abraham and Sarah went into a kingdom. The king asked about Sarah. Sarah uh, the Abraham said, she's my sister. So the king took her. So God punished the king in the kingdom. So God speaks to the king directly. And what does he tell the king? He, sa he says to him, he says to him, for Abraham, is, is a, he's a prophet. He will pray for you and you will live. So he tells King Abimelech, return Sarah and ask Abraham, who's a prophet, to pray for you. Well, he's already talking to the king directly, one-on-one. -on -one. Why is he bringing Abraham into the story? But here we see God wants Abraham to pray for the king. On another occasion, Job. If you remember the story of Job and his three difficult friends who came to comfort him and all they did was heart... Uh, ache his heart even more. After they, they, they said things about God that weren't true, God said to them, go, make an offer up a, for yourself a burnt offering, and my servant, my servant Job will pray for you. So not just offer a burnt offering and I will forgive you. No, offer a burnt offering and Job will pray for you. And as a result of their prayer, I will forgive you. His prayer, I will forgive you. So here, one example, God himself, speaking about his servants, praying on behalf of others. Um, there are many examples where uh, God's servants pray to God on behalf of his people. The first being the beautiful story of Abraham and, the, and Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you remember that exchange or no? God says, how can I keep what I'm about to do from Abraham? How? Because he saw Abraham as his friend. What a beautiful... Uh, what a beautiful... Um, relationship Abraham had with God. So he said, how am I going to keep it? Let me tell him what I'm going to do. And if you remember the story, Abraham says, God, you're going to destroy the whole city. What if there's 50 good people in the city? Do you guys remember the story or should I continue? Remember the story? It goes down to how many? Huh? Ten people. He says, if I find, so Abraham, God kept, God and Abraham kept negotiating. Finally, God said, will you save the city if there's ten people? And, and God said, I will save the city for ten people. And, and then Abraham got shy and stopped at ten. Did God find 10 people in the city? Yes. No. Very important lesson to all of us, but it's another topic. Be very careful. It's easy to see what's happening around us and to copy it, right? Everybody's doing it. God can come one day, God forbid, to Monroe, New Jersey, and not find 10 people that have not turned away from him. Right? It happened the time of Noah. How many people got on the boat? Eight people. The whole world turned away from God except for eight people. In, New in Monroe, New Jersey, can God find 10 people or not? Or Jersey City or any place for that matter. History has a, a way of repeating itself. So be very careful. Yes, we're surrounded by sin. We're surrounded by evil, but we're different. We're not of this world. So keep that in the back of your mind. So we have this first example where Abraham pleads with God, and God listens, and God goes all the way down to 10 people to save the city. Another example, Moses and the ch children of Israel. Do you remember... Moses goes up to pray. He comes down. What are the people doing? 
uh, worshiping a golden calf. He was only up there for 40 days, and they forgot everything God did with them, everything they forgot. So what did God want to do? He wanted to destroy them all. Was, it, was Moses okay with that? He said, no, I can't, I can't. And he said, what did he say to him? He said, turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self, and then dot, 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 the Lord relented. The Lord did not destroy them. So another example of a man praying for his people and God, I don't want to say changing his mind, but God's plans changed. God's plans changed. Another example, so we have God telling people to pray. We have examples of people praying on behalf of God's children. We have examples of God taking consideration for people that have already died. Who is his favorite psalmist and prophet? King David. And he had a special love for King David, even though David was flawed. And, um, and we know David's sins. But David was very special to God. So later on, he goes in many occasions in the Psalms and other places, for the sake of my son David. So he wanted to, do, he wanted to take away the kingdom from Solomon. But he didn't have a heart. He said, you know, not because of your father David, I will not take it away from you. I will take it away from your son. And not only am I not going to take it away from your son, I'm going to take away most of it, but leave him a small piece for the sake of David. So people who have already died, Pastor David was dead at this point, but God remembers his son, his servant, and because of his servant, he considers. These are all examples of intercession. God changes his approach because of his children, because of his servants, all of us, because of our prayers. Um... He, I, I'm going to stop here because of, I want to get into St. Mary, but I will leave you with one thing. Pope Shenouda, he said, imagine these servants of God and their limitations while we are here on this earth, and they're praying and God's listening to them. Imagine when they are freed from the body and they're in paradise, and then they're praying, what, how much more fervent is their prayer? And he gave an example about what capabilities these servants of God have once they enter paradise. He says, remember, this is how meticulous Pope Shenouda of blessed memories. He said, do you remember the story of Lazarus and the rich man? And, a and Lazarus is sitting in the bosom of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? And when the rich man, and when the rich man says, uh, send Lazarus to go take care of, let's send Lazarus to tell, to warn my brothers, um, the Abraham says two things. The first thing Abraham says is while, you were, while Lazarus was alive, he suffered. And while you were alive, you had good things. I don't remember the exact quote. But the first thing Pope Shenouda highlights for us, he says, Abraham, while he's in paradise, knows what was going on with Lazarus, and he knows what was going on with the rich man. Number one. Number two, Abraham references Moses. Moses came how many years after Abraham? So even before there was a Moses, there was Abraham. And Abraham passed. But Abraham is referencing Moses in paradise because he knows. So he, His Holiness was trying to point this idea of our loved ones, when they make their way to heaven, and they're praying for us, they're praying for us with a different understanding, with a different vision. Okay? So all of this is, serves as our introduction to one point, that the idea of praying for each other is in the Bible. The idea of people who've passed away praying for us is in the Bible. And it's very critical to our faith. I'm going to end with one quote from Pope Shenouda that highlights two things very important to the concept of uh, intercession. He says the following. He says, The prayers of humans, whether living or departed, for each other is evidence of mutual, mutual love among them, number one, and of faith of the living that those departed are still living and their prayers are acceptable to God as an indication that God honors his saints. So what is he saying? He's saying two things. When we, in, we ask a saint to intercede for us, we are acknowledging the importance of one church, one body, all praying for each other. So while we're alive, we pray for each other. And even after one of us makes their way to heaven, we're still praying for each other, number one. So this is a communion of love. The second important thing besides communion of love, when we ask one of the saints who has departed to pray for us, we are by... by 
by this gesture acknowledging the saint is still alive. Not only is he alive, they can hear my request, they can also offer a prayer for us. So this idea of intercession is very critical to a Christian understanding. Our faith is we don't die, we depart. We just prayed the litany of the departed. We just go from one place to another, but we're one church. And when, I, when, when my family was alive before they passed, were they not praying for me? Yes. Because they went to another place, are they going to stop praying for me? Of course not. Of course not. Let, leave it also to the saints also who have the ability to love more and have the ability to know and to answer or to help when we ask them to pray for us who have the capacity and the love to pray for all of humanity. So serving that as the background to our conversation, let's, if we can, read together the, uh, from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verse 1 through, I think, 10 or 11. Let me put it on the screen. It's the story of the wedding of Cana of Galilee. Should I pull it up? Okay. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw some out now, and take it to the master of the feast, and they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifest his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Glory be to God forever. Amen. So here we have, there's not many, um, there's not many stories or mention of St. Mary in scripture, but this is one of them. Um, and this is a beautiful story, and we have a feast. It's one of the feasts of the church, the feast of the wedding of Cana of Galilee. And this is one of the signs, the first miracles of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are many lessons we can learn about intercession from this story. And if you'll allow me, I want to cover six lessons that we can learn from this exchange between St. Mary and our Lord Jesus Christ. The first lesson we can learn is that when she prayed, or I, her, when she spoke to our Lord Jesus Christ, it's a, she's praying or she's talking to God on behalf of someone, so she's interceding. When she prayed, she prayed with humility and love. Many of the church fathers, when they speak about this, par or this story, they say, how is St. Mary to know? How is St. Mary to know that they have run out of wine, except she was where? working in the kitchen. There's no other way. Guests don't know what's happening. If they ran out of food, if they ran out of wine, nobody knows except those who are in it, who are working in it. So they're saying, number one, we know about St. Mary that her, she had her sleeves rolled up and she was working, number one. Number two, when she saw there was a problem, she felt the need to do something. Love for her friends, love for the couple, and humility in that she's in the kitchen working with them. Why is this important? Many times we can see someone who's struggling with something. And we say, oh, we're going to pray for them. But our heart and our mind is in a different place. Meaning what? They are going through this problem. He is struggling with addiction. She is struggling with X, Y, Z. And it's as if there's a separation. And as if I, I feel bad for them. I pity them. 
So I will pray for them. St. Mary, speaking to our Lord Jesus Christ, is speaking from, I am with them in this pain. I am working with them, and this embarrassment for them will be an embarrassment for me. So please, my son, do something. So she loves them. She is serving with them. She is in a humble state, and she prays to God because she is not only empathizing, but with them. So number one, when we pray for others, and when we ask saints to intercede, I don't want to say put yourself in their shoes, but remember each of us in this room is carrying a burden. It might be different, but there's no one here that is not carrying a burden. So if you're carrying a burden, the fact that Abuna's burden is different than mine doesn't mean that we're not all in need of prayer and not all in need of someone to help with this burden. So we, we lift our eyes to heaven and we lift our hands and our hearts. So St. Mary did just that, but she did that um, with love and with humility. Number two, so lesson number one, we pray and we ask for intercession with humility and with love. Number two, she prayed without giving God instructions. A beautiful statement. When she found out there was a problem, what did she tell our Lord Jesus Christ? They have no wine. Simple statement. They have no wine, period, full stop. Well, obviously, our creator knows everything. He doesn't need to be told facts. But St. Mary proceeded to tell him facts. And many times, my beloved, when we pray, we seem to think that we know more than God. Forgive me, maybe I do. And I'm giving God instructions on how to solve my problems. So God, please, not, for example, um, I'm struggling with a health issue. God, heal me. Not, God, you know that I am sick. Or God, I am in, you know that I am in need of healing. There's a lot of times, a lot of times we, when we speak to God, we are telling him what to do. We are telling him what to do. St. Mary, in her simplicity, in her beauty, just told God, this is the issue. This is the issue. Um, It takes a lot of uh, faith, and we'll talk about that in, a, in, in the next bullet, to speak to God without, um, I guess the point I'm saying is sometimes our faith in God is dependent on God responding to my prayer a specific way. God didn't listen to my prayer. Who said God didn't listen to my prayer? Well, because he didn't give me what I asked. Who said that God has to give you what he asks to prove that he's listening? All Anybody here that has children, when they ask you for something, is the answer always yes? I'm sure sometimes it's no. I'm sure sometimes it's next week. But it's not always yes. Many times, my friends, that when we pray, we begin to accuse God of certain things that are not fair to God because our request has this understanding of what the solution is. So when we pray for someone or when we ask a saint to pray for us, the issue is to present the problem to God, not to tell God what the solution is. Because maybe the solution, let's say I'm praying for health. Maybe the solution is this disease, my, my grace, as he said to St. Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Maybe, St. Paul, you need to be sick. This sickness is for you and I'm not going to take it away. But if St. Paul expected healing, or I'm not going to serve you again, I'm not going to heal anybody again, you're, I'm done with you, God, because you don't want to heal me, then St. Paul is telling God what he wants the solution to be. So when we pray for someone, we present a problem. When we pray for ourselves, when we ask saints to pray for us, we present the problem to God, and we let God take care of the rest. Number three, when we pray and when we seek intercession, we pray with faith. We pray with faith. St. Mary 
when our Lord Jesus Christ said to her, he said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not come. Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not come. Is that answer by our Lord Jesus Christ clear or not clear? It's very clear. My hour has not come. It's not my business that there is no wine. Right or wrong? How did she respond? She said to him, whatever, she said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Whatever he says, do it. What does that mean? He's going to answer. He's going to take care of it. Whatever he says, just do it. He didn't, she didn't wait. She didn't go back to him and say, Jesus, but I'm your mother. But Jesus, if they don't have wine, they're going to be embarrassed. But Jesus, can you imagine? She didn't, there was no dialogue like Abraham and God. It was simple. Whatever he tells you, take care of it. That is faith. She presents a problem, and she knows with certainty that God will address this issue. This is faith. This is faith. That when she speaks, she knows that he is listening. Now, what did she have faith in? Number one, she had faith that he heard her. Sometimes we pray, and when we don't see a response quickly, or when we think, when he says to us, my hour has not come, we say, oh, maybe he didn't hear me. No, he heard. The hour has not come. So when we pray, you have to believe with all your heart that God hears. He says not a hair, not a drop of, of, of tears will fall off your cheek without he collects it. Every hair on your head is numbered. In, in the book of Isaiah, he says, I've carved you in the palm of my hands. In the Psalms, he says, uh, keep me, O Lord, as the apple of your eye. We are the apple of God's eye. What do you mean that you talk to him and he ignores you? Even imperfect parents, still, um, even if they're not paying attention, they always hear their children. Imagine our Heavenly Father. So number one, when, when she prayed, she had faith that he heard. Number two, she had faith that he loves her. That he loves her. Not only because she was his mother, not only because she was his mother, but because humanity, God so loved the world he came. The fact that he was with her was an expression of God's love for humanity. He loves us. So when we pray, why do we think he's not listening? Maybe because we're looking for a solution at a certain time, in a certain place, and we've given all these criteria. But when we talk to God, we have to have complete trust. He heard me, and he loves me. Not only did he hear me and he loved me, number three, he loves all humanity. So this extra point is this. Maybe you could say, well, he listened to her because he's his mother. He has to listen to his mother. He loves his mother. Yes, St. Mary is our queen. St. Mary is the pride of the human race. But he not only loves his mother, he loves us too. We are very dear to him. So I have faith that he hears me, I have faith that he loves me, I have faith that he's capable of solving my problem. Yani, it's one thing to pray to someone who loves me but has no ability to do anything. And there's another to pray to someone who has the ability to do something but doesn't love me. But I have a God who loves me. And he's powerful, able to do all things. So how can I say that he couldn't do something for me. Why is this important? Because if I pray about, I'm going to keep using the example of health. If I pray about health, and I know that he heard me, and I know that he loves me, and I know he has the ability to heal me, and he chooses to keep me in my condition, is that not what's best for me or not? And this is how a Christian has this joy about them. Always at peace. Why? Because my father happens to be the Almighty. My father happens to love me personally. And my father happens to have everything in his control. So if this is where he wants me to be, and this is what I'm going through, then thank you, God. I trust you. The last thing is she had faith that whatever he does is good. We say in the prayer of thanksgiving, let us give thanks to the beneficent, the one who does good. God can only do good. He can't do bad. Even when I'm a miserable son and I deserve every punishment, he can't do bad. He only does good. 
He only does good. So our faith is very important. The third lesson we learn when we pray and when we seek intercession, we have to trust God that he hears, that he loves, that he's capable of solving, and that everything he does is good. Everything he does is good. Number four. So we said lesson number one was what? Humility and love when we seek intercession. Lesson number two, we tell, we pray to God without instructions. Number three, we pray to God with faith and trust. Number four, when we learn, we learn, oh, from this story, we learn that God listens to intercessions. God listens to intercessions. All the stories that I talked to you about before in the Old Testament are examples of intercessions. Here we see St. Mary, his response to St. Mary was what? They have no wine, he said, my hour has not come. Is that not a clear answer? I don't want to do this. My, here's my mind, I want to go left. Right? But because his mother asked what happened, he went right. He went right. So it is extremely important, my friends, to remember that to use the saints, I was telling Abuna, Abuna, let me do the prayer of uh, the departed because I want to greet the saints. In our church tradition, when we pray, we believe we are surrounded. When we come before God's holy altar, we are surrounded by the angels, the archangels, and all the heavenly saints. That we can't see them, but they're in our midst. Even when Father is offering incense, when he faces the east, when he faces the west, he says, hail to the choir. Of, wait, greetings, Gabriel. Hail, greetings, what do we say? Gabriel, what's the appropriate place? Hail to the choir of angels, the martyrs, and the saints. So Father, when he's do doing incense to the west, he's greeting all the saints, the angels, and the martyrs. So we believe they're here. Every icon is just a, um, a visual to remind me that Saint, the three saintly youth are here. Abraham and Isaac are here. Every saint is here. And the tradition is when we're walking around the church, we greet each saint, asking them to pray for us and to pray for the forgiveness of our, of our sins and the congregation's sins. Greetings, greetings, greetings. So they're amongst us. It's silly to have such a friend, Saint Mary, who is the mother of us all, to be your mother and you never ask her to pray for you. Or any of the saints who have come before us, who have laid such a price, uh, have lived such a life, and we don't ask them to pray for us. So from this story, it's very clear that St. Mary, she asked, and God said, okay. He didn't want to, but he said, okay. Imagine, my beloved, if all of these saints, every night when we pray, we, we en enroll them in our prayers, and we ask each of them to pray for something. Saint so-and-so, please don't forget my daughter. Pray for her because of X, Y, Z. Saint so-and-so, don't forget my son. And the beautiful part, is each saint has a story. And with each story, they can relate. So for example, Saint Elizabeth spent many years trying to have children until finally God told, the angel told Zechariah, God has heard your prayers. So whenever I'm in front of the icon of Saint Elizabeth, I, die, I say, Saint Elizabeth, don't forget your daughter A, B, and C, pray for them. This, with faith, you have Saint Monica who's struggling with her, her son, we pray for all the mothers who are struggling or parents that are struggling with their youth. Every saint has a story. Saint Macrina or Saint Macarius who were wrongfully accused and suffered tremendously falsely for a false accusation. Anybody who's, who's, who's feeling um, that they were uh, a victim of such a thing, you pray for them. Every saint has a story who can relate. You ask the saint, please, you know what it feels like to be wrongfully accused. Pray for so-and-so who's wrongfully accused. So in, we know that God listens to intercessions. The lesson number five, we learn that God listens to his mother specifically. This story is not about any other person except St. Mary. And the stories and the miracles about St. Mary are limitless, infinite. When she appeared in Egypt in the 60s, and you can look it up, the, the, it was reported, she was appeared for such a long time, all the international newspapers documented her appearance in Zaytun, and the amount of miracles that were recorded from her, uh, her presence in Egypt are innumerable. So not only do intercessions, God hears the prayers of the saints,
But St. Mary, as you saw in the praises, as you will praise the rest of her fast, has a very special place because she was made, was worthy enough and pure and holy enough to receive for our Lord Jesus Christ to take flesh from her. Wow. What kind of preparation, what kind of life she lived to be able to carry, to be a second throne for our Lord Jesus Christ. So number three, uh, sorry, so this, the number five, she, number five, St. Mary specifically, St. Mary specifically, uh, God listens to St. Mary specifically. And finally, number six, God gives us more than what we can think of or imagine. When he turned the water into wine, was it any ordinary wine? No. They had to, the master of the ceremony had to come and say, if you remember, he said, what did he say? He said, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. When God works, it is beyond, beyond what we can imagine. It's perfect. It's beautiful. It's timely. It's exactly what we need when we need it, if we trust him. The problem is we're impatient. We're little annoying children that want everything a certain way right away. But God is perfect and beautiful. And when he responds, it is far greater than anything that we can imagine. So we learn six things when we pray. Number one, he's... Um, let me repeat them because I forget them. Someone, someone repeat them for me. Because Number one, when we pray with love and humility. Number two, without giving instructions. Number three, uh, with faith. And we talked about f faith that he's hearing me, faith that he loves me, faith that he's able, able to, to do something about my prayer, and faith that everything he does is going to be good. Number four, we said uh, God listens to intercessions. Number five, St. Mary, our queen, he listens to her specifically. And number six, every single thing he does is far greater than we can ask. Uh, may, may St. Mary and her blessings of this beautiful time of the year be with us. And we pray and we ask her to intercede for us.